All right. Solon was followed by um, Pisistratus. who was the very thing that Solon didn't want. He did not want a strong man to come in. But then again, Solon himself had been given absolute power. So uh, when Solon retired, he was hoping democracy would come about. But instead, a, um, a tyrant came on the scene. Now, again, folk, I have to tell you, that word tyrant is not always, in Greek, in Greek times, it did not mean necessarily a bad person. Now today, we English-speaking people we use the word tyrant. It's always in a negative sense. It's always a person who's an absolute bad ruler, an evil man. But in that day, the word tyrant was simply meant a person who ruled all by himself. Pisistratus took over, seized power, and um, he remained popular with the merchants and the industrial people. He died and tried to turn the authority over to his son, but the people rebelled against his son, and that family's dynasty came to an end in the second generation. Next ruler of significance was Cleisthenes. Now I promise you, this list is going to end with the next man. What Cleisthenes did, remember him for, was he made Athens more democratic, set up a democracy, and tried to make people a little bit more equal. <coughs> One of the things he did, he said that you Athenians belong to families called tribes. So you belong to family orders that are called tribes, but some tribes have gotten bigger than others. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to organize everybody into 10 tribes. Forget your ancestral affiliation. What you do is pull out, I mean, I'm going to establish a lottery, and everybody will be assigned a tribe, one, two, three, up to ten, by lot, and all the ten tribes will be equal. And he hoped by this to uh, make for equal political affiliations, equal political parties. So he organized ten tribes, and the Athenians were assigned to a tribe by lot. And it was hoped that uh, by this way it would make things a little bit more equal more democratic, and one group of people would not then overpower another group. Some of these things might seem a little bit strange to us, but nevertheless, they seemed to work back then. In addition, he set up a council of 500. Oh yes, council of 500. I'd say it's two things, or 10 tribes, There were 500 men who met in a group that the Greeks called the Ecclesia, from which we get our word church. Uh, at the moment, I'm not going to ask you to write that down. They were, they said, they were back in an assembly. Now, the, the, five, the Council of 500 wound up getting a really bad name for itself because several generations later, like 300 years later, it was this same Council of 500 that condemned Socrates to death. Um, Nevertheless, at the time, it seemed like the thing to do. So um, essentially, he was setting up what we might call a representative democracy, where that the council made the decisions. The council was um, elected about 50 from each tribe. All designed to make Athens more and more of a democracy and less and less a tyranny. book then jumps to uh, Greece. The, the Greek people began to leave Greece and fan out into the Mediterranean region, partly because the climate of Greece was harsh. There wasn't much room for pasture land, and uh, therefore they could not do cattle farming. Farming was very difficult, and most of the region was very mountainous. So a lot of Greeks began to fan out. They began to move into Asia Minor, what we know of today as Turkey. 
Oh yeah, the same map I had. Anyway, basically they spread out here to Asia Minor or they spread over here into southern Italy. And a lot of Greeks are known to have found their way into these regions here. And sometimes they'd back to or visit their relatives when they moved and uh, they would introduce them to their foreign ideas, the people. You know, basically they were colonizing, picking up new ideas. And some people believe this greatly enriched Greek culture because it was an infusion of their own culture and a mixture of the better parts of other cultures. And uh, they began to pick up a lot of ideas from Egypt. Now, while I'm on the subject of Egypt, there have been a lot of books written about what kind of influence Egypt had on the Greeks. It is believed that Solon went to Egypt. Then later, Socrates is believed to have gone to Egypt. Plato certainly went to Egypt. Pythagoras went to Egypt. And they learned their arts. Pythagoras learned the Pythagorean theorem and learned about triangles from Egypt, as did Plato. Plato got a lot of his history of the Greeks from the Egyptians. The Egyptians who apparently kept better records of early Greek history than the, the Greeks had themselves. And the Greeks were influenced greatly by the people of Egypt. Um, the Phoenicians gave the Greeks the alphabet. which the Greeks took and made some improvements on and made some changes and made the uh, Greek language easier to read and easier to write than, uh, than either Egyptian hieroglyphics or Mesopotamian cuneiform. All right, believe me, I'm gonna have a lot more to say about Greek foreign influence later and more to say about, uh, about Greek religion. Just, be, just keep in mind, because I'm going to mention later that they, they influenced the Egyptians. I've already mentioned how that the Egyptians had a class of, we, we might call them priests, but they were looked on by the people at that time as being not just priests, but scholars, scribes, and they kept a certain history that they only passed down to the elite. Then the, the knowledge of geometry, for instance, that the Egyptians had may have but it may have been worth that the uh, Greeks got their geometry. Now again, if you study geometry, you'll learn that it came from Euclid, the Greek, and Euclid taught, among other people, Pythagoras. You may not be told that Euclid is believed to have gone to Egypt, as did Pythagoras, as did Solon. Solon got his ideas of government from the Egyptians. So a lot of this Egyptian influence, and of course, you know, you're hopefully aware that the Jews spent a lot of time in Egypt, 400 years, and then Moses was schooled in Pharaoh's schools. So uh, Egypt, the influence of Egypt was felt far and wide. All right, takes us up to an interruption of Greek history, I mean of Greek development, when the Persians invaded. All told, the Persians were to invade twice, Persian Empire had extended all the way here. They'd conquered Egypt. They'd conquered what is today Turkey. They'd gone all the way into what is today Pakistan, the Indus Valley, and had a huge empire. And next on the horizon was Greece. We will learn next time that the Persians were not able to conquer Greece. They tried twice. Two Persian kings came, King Darius I and his son Xerxes. They were not able to conquer Greece, so what happened eventually the Greeks would come in and conquer them. But that's a subject for later chapter. All right.